one and we're live hi everyone welcome back to the third class of this year's mit iap computational law workshop course today we have an exciting agenda for you where we'll be hearing from two speakers um which you'll hear who you'll hear from shortly so i'm going to just pass it off to daza to get the class officially started Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you so much, TMA. Um, so during the first half of uh, class today, we are honored to have Senator Chris Rothfuss address the class on the new Wyoming personal digital identity legislation. And uh, we'll probably also hear about the organizational digital identity legislation. Um, this, is, these are, this is legislation that uh, the select committee that he chairs is currently drafting. Uh, and the select committee is also working on other relevant measures, including an automated and autonomous LLC, um, data trusts, and, and other very important emerging legal frameworks. And of course, uh, Wyoming has been a global leader in creating a, a legal framework for cryptocurrency and for blockchain in general. So uh, to learn more about Senator Rothfuss's work and the work of the select committee, um, please take a look at the email um, sent out uh, yesterday uh, and go ahead and click on the link. Uh, and I encourage you to click through the materials for some of their meetings. They also have links to um, their, uh, their hearings, which are incredibly informative. Uh, during the second uh, half of class, well, actually, let's do one thing at a time, but we, we, we will hear from Yulila of New America Foundation to talk to us about the future of property, but I won't give too much of that away just yet. So um, stand by Yulila and uh, why don't we, oh, I'm sorry. And at the end of class, I know many of you I can see um, are, have elected to do class projects. Brian's going to go a little bit deeper into the process for that. And even if you aren't doing a class project yourself, I encourage you to listen. Um, it's it's a um, one of the relatively unique things about how we structure these innovation oriented classes through the Media Lab uh, and in conjunction with the Sloan Business School. Um, so we've got a long history of um, innovation oriented classes in the um, new media space, um, in the developing economy space and and um, and otherwise, and, and we follow this general template and we're trying to apply it now to computational law. So um, do have a listen. And, uh, and with that, uh, without further ado, um, Senator Rothfuss, uh, if you'd uh, be willing to come off mute, I'd like, it's my pleasure and as I said, honor to introduce you to the um, MIT computational law course this year. And, um, and uh, we'd be grateful if you could uh, say a few words about who you are and what you've been working on lately. Absolutely, Daza, and thank you so much for the opportunity to chat with this group. I, these are the folks that hopefully we'll be uh, working with over the years ahead and, and uh, practicing potentially in, in these Wyoming digital asset laws that we've been working on uh, and, and working hard on for the past uh, four years in, in the state of Wyoming. Um, I'm Senator Chris Rothfuss. I'm the Senate Minority Leader in the Wyoming Legislature. I've been a member of the Wyoming Legislature for about a decade. Uh, I have a background in science and engineering. I'm a PhD chemical engineer and, and uh, spent time at the U.S. Department of State working on advanced technology foreign policy for three years as a AAAS science and technology diplomacy fellow. Uh, so I've spent a lot of time in advanced technologies, uh, doing advanced technology consulting, uh, both before and while I've been in the Wyoming legislature. And this is a topic that came up a few years ago in, as we were working on digital identity. And as we were working on information privacy and, and working on uh, personally identifiable information and, and the fact that Wyoming had just rubbish statutes at the time and, and we were really trying to improve those statutes and learned along the way that uh, at that point in time, Wyoming in fact had probably the worst digital asset and cryptocurrency statutes in the country just by random coincidence. Nobody really had any at the time. Uh, but the way ours were being used and interpreted really precluded any type of commerce in cryptocurrency space, which was obviously emerging. Uh, so we decided to take a look at that and, and try to fix our problems that we identified and then started looking around the country as legislators do, right? The first thing you do is you look for solutions that somebody else has already 
uh, come up with and you copy and paste it. There's really not a lot of plagiarism sensitivity in in statutory drafting you you just go and copy and paste and and uh, and do your best with that if you can get away with it well there was nothing to copy and paste because it, it turned out that most of the statutes surrounding digital assets were were really just by luck of the draw in in however their their statutes were previously drafted and and were being utilized and it it came to us then that this was an open space and there was a lot of opportunity for setting policy in digital assets, in cryptocurrencies, in how to treat uh, these types of classes of property. So we started forging that territory and, and took a leadership position to start creating digital asset governance in a way that enabled it instead of restricted it. Some other states had already started to really apply restrictions. Uh, Wyoming is, is very libertarian in its mindset and, and tries to keep things open and keep things working. And so we created a task force a few years ago, and now it's a select committee to work on these issues and topics and, and try to move them forward. So as some of you probably know, we, we, started off by creating the first definition of a, a consumer token uh, as opposed to a security. And uh, it was called an open blockchain token at the time uh, and utilize the Howey test, which everyone's familiar with to, to delineate security from non-security in statute. Uh, we formally recognized cryptocurrencies as the equivalent under our statutes of a currency. So they would not be subject to property taxes or, or ad valorem taxes and would be managed as, as a currency. Uh, and then we continued to build off of those accomplishments and, and ended up with a, a few things that, that really were putting us in leadership positions nationally. One was uh, custodianship of digital assets, where we effectively took the uniform commercial code and we mapped digital asset property rights onto the uniform commercial code. We didn't change our statutes with regard to the UCC, we simply added on a little section that said, with regard to digital assets, this is how all of the nuances of digital assets will be treated under the UCC to provide clarity in Wyoming statute, to provide certainty for industry that was operating in Wyoming, and to provide certainty for our courts of how to treat digital assets with regard to the Uniform Commercial Code. And uh, that was pretty game changing. And, and we actually flew in the face of a lot of the decisions that the Uniform Law Commission was making at the time. Uh, we fought some battles with them because we were doing things in a much more direct ownership instead of indirect ownership approach. Uh, so we took, we took a different path and uh, I believe it was the correct path and it's been successful. Other states have been emulating it. And one of the other primary accomplishments that we uh, pushed forward was a new type of bank charter called a special purpose depository institution. Uh, Speedy Bank is what we call it. It's a 100% reserve bank that has the capacity to not be required to, to uh, hold FDIC insurance since it's 100% depository, which gives it more flexibility, gets it out of some federal requirements and allows it to then do some things that FDIC insured banks can't do where right now that means uh, engage in custodianship of digital assets as well as banking activity. So these are state chartered banks. We have two of them currently chartered and these are our full nationally recognized banking institutions with all banking rights and privileges uh, and the ability to hold and uh, uh, act as a fiduciary for uh, for digital assets. So it's a, it's kind of a new, new realm there. We've worked on a lot of other legislation. I won't go into those details uh, unless asked uh, to kind of get into the nuances. We've actually passed over 20 pieces of legislation over the past few years, but there's a couple of things that we're working on as we're, we're looking forward that are, are really critical and essential. And one of those is digital identity that Daza has been working with Wyoming on trying to draft and getting to the point where digital identity is sufficiently enabled such that businesses, individuals, organizations are capable of having their digital identity represent them in contracts, 
in legal agreements, in negotiations, in whatever else they need it to do, as an authority for property rights, for contract rights, for privacy rights, in a way that really can't be done anywhere else statutorily. And it turns out to be a hell of a challenge. Uh, the, the more you dig in, the more questions occur, the more challenges occur. And uh, so this draft language that we have, and I'm gonna get into a couple of points. We don't need to walk through the entirety of, of the first bill draft, but I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I'm not a big fan of slides, but I do have two just to focus around. Um, so if I may share those, which it looks like I'm okay to do. All right, hopefully give me a thumbs up if you can see that. We've got a thumbs up, excellent. There's just a couple of concepts of this bill I wanna go through and then I do wanna open for discussion and questions. So we have a draft of this legislation. It's already on the website. We've worked hard on this draft and it's only three pages long, which tells you how complicated it is when you've got a three page draft and you've probably spent hundreds of hours of, of human time in getting to those three pages. But we arrived at a few concepts and, and the first that I wanna point out is that we focused on definitions. So on the right side, you see some definitions uh, and we want to be able to delineate conceptually and legally between personal digital identity and the rights that would be imbued to a personal digital identity of a natural individual, a natural human. And you see that we've defined that as a personal digital identity means the intangible digital representation of, by, and for a natural person over which he has dominion. We have gendered language in Wyoming statute, which is really annoying. We've been trying to fix that. We haven't gotten the bill passed, so I'm going to apologize formally on behalf of Wyoming. We are the equality state. We were the first state in 1869 to recognize a women's right to vote, and yet we have gendered language. My apologies. Uh, over which he has dominion and through which he intentionally communicates or acts. A lot of time has gone into that and it is not perfect. And if any of you have better words and better approaches, I am interested in hearing them. Work with Daza, work with me, and, and we'll try and master this definition. And then we have a parallel definition for organizational digital identity recognizing though that organizations are not going to be granted explicit personhood like they were, for example, through Citizens United. We want to be able to delineate separate rights and recognitions for individuals and organizations. So we have different definitions and we wanna make sure that we can hang different rights on those definitions as we proceed. And then you see at the bottom, we, we're not using it yet, but digital identity of things. Uh, all of you know we're going to need that at some point. We're not tackling that quite yet, but we know we're going to need it, and we don't know what those things are going to be. But as we plan for the future, that's part of the discussion. So when we look back to how we're structuring this, these definitions are going to be integral into what we do moving forward, where we start imbuing rights and authorities on those. We put these definitions in our Title VIII, where we have general provisions which govern for all statutes. And then we reference them back in Title 40, Chapter 30, which is a new digital identity act that we're working on through this legislation. And one of the concepts that it's important to, to contemplate here is the purpose of this type of governance. Why are we doing this? And what are we trying to achieve? Uh, and one of the things that Wyoming is focused on through all of our digital asset legislation is the idea that we want to enable through regulation, which sounds counterintuitive, but all of you are in the realm where I think you get what I'm getting at here, which is if you provide effective regulation, it actually opens doors instead of closes them because it provides clarity of governance for corporations, industry, individuals, where they know where they stand. So as long as it's not prohibitive and restrictive, but is enabling, then you create value for your people, your constituents, 
your your businesses rather than taking away those rights and and that's what we're always focused on through this select committee and task force is is adding value adding capabilities uh, giving new rights and authorities and you see we want to provide this corporate certainty and we want to protect individual rights and recognize individual rights as well as corporate rights and organizational rights but what we've started to struggle with and we haven't fully tackled yet is the idea of privacy rights versus property rights with regard to digital and organizational identity. So what does that mean? We all know privacy rights, we all know property rights, but with a digital identity, a personal digital identity as an example, the privacy rights are going to be rights that are inalienable to you. They're going to be something that you, you're not going to sign away, you're not going to give up, you're going to be able to protect it gets to what GDPR, which I mentioned below, you're all familiar with the EU General Data Protection Regulations. Uh, California Consumer Privacy Act focuses heavily on privacy rights and protections. And these are concepts that we want to be sure to enable through our legislation so that individuals and corporations will have separate but recognized privacy associated with their personal an organizational digital identity that will not be severable, will not be assignable or transferable, will be inalienable. But at the same time, you've got property rights associated with your digital identity. Information about you that's generated about you, that, that you sign over, that you agree to sell, that you agree to lease perhaps or, or rent out, uh, agreements that you enter into where that information, some personally identifiable information, other information you generate, photos of you, for example, where you're going to lose control of them and it'll be very hard to get back. That goes more into property law. So we're struggling right now trying to draw those lines and establish those barriers as we draft this. And that's one of the things we're working on. It's not in the bill yet, but that's one of the directions we want to go. And the last point is going to be, where do we want to go? I'm going to get back to that in one moment, but I just want to go to the next slide quickly, which is, is the entirety of what we've imbued into the first draft of this digital identity legislation. We want to tackle principles of self-sovereign identity. We want to do a lot more, but what we've put in so far is effectively a mirror of UEDA. Uh, so our, our electronic... Uh, signatures act and and recognizing that that's uniform more or less nationwide as a, as a model law uh, from the uniform law commission and we're calling out the fact that an individual's digital identity so this personal digital identity you see in roman at one uh, will be recognized such that acts taken through it will be attributed to the natural person Authoritatively in law, our statute will say an act by the digital identity is the equivalent of an act by the person. And then obviously mirror language for organizations. And then similar UEDA language about the effects, which shall be determined from the context, which is again taken from UEDA. So it doesn't sound like we're doing a hell of a lot. We're trying to get a definition as perfect as we can because once we have that definition, we get to the where do we want to go from here and what are we going to do to enable it? We're going to add concepts and principles of self-sovereign identity. We're going to add privacy rights. We're going to add property rights. We're going to allow this digital identity to engage on behalf of the individual authoritatively through smart contracts. Uh, we're going to recognize these organizational digital identities through the state itself authoritatively where we'll stand behind that digital identity. And we want to create this framework such that commerce, transactions, contracts, all of the things that we're used to doing traditionally can authoritatively be accomplished through this digital identity. And you'll probably all see right away that it's a very different approach from how the EU and California have done it where they're recognizing at the core just the, the individual and then they're granting and layering privacy rights on. 
Uh, we do that too in Wyoming statute and it's kludgy and it's ugly and it's inelegant and it's not particularly effective. We, we certainly don't have anything magical. So we're trying a different approach where we create this authoritative digital identity and then imbue it with rights on behalf of the individual or organization that stands behind it. And we're, we're enthusiastic about it, but it's a hell of a challenge. And again, I, I welcome all of your input and would be willing to and happy to take questions and, and discussion on it at this point, Daza. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Senator Rothfuss. Um, uh, I'm so glad we're recording this uh, and we're, we're going <laughs> to publish this on our site and, uh, and blast it widely. But uh, Great. honestly, what you just shared is, is just so fundamentally important. Um, and uh, so there are a couple of questions. Um, there's a few questions. So I'm going to group two of them to get us started because um, I think they're two sides of the same coin. Uh, so first, Walter asks, would the language of intentionally communicates, okay, as part of the definition of personal digital identity, um, kick in for cases of deep fakes where, for instance, YouTube videos are uploaded purporting to be a communication from the person speaking? Um, or, or is that actually a violation? So that's one side of the coin. And then let me just layer on the second side. Mm -hmm. uh, are all, this is from Brian, uh, you listen uh, are all my avatars, some of which might be fantastic, like, uh, like in Centaur world or something, a personal digital identity for me if I intentionally act through them? Uh, so I have a couple of thoughts on that, but do, do you want to go or shall I say a couple of well, things? I, I think on the first question, the of, by, and for clause really comes into play. Uh, if it's a deep fake, that is not of, by, and for, in my opinion. So it, it fails that test. And that's a pretty rigid test that we put in there. And, and that was intentional. And there was a lot of discussion about the of, by, and for uh, to get at the concept that if somebody's acting secondhand, we don't want that to be uh, truly your digital identity, because we don't want that to be authoritatively acting on your behalf. Uh, so that's the first. With regard to the avatar, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think to a certain degree, if it's acting on behalf of you, your avatar is part of your digital identity. But uh, we, it does start to get into the weeds a little bit of the privacy versus property aspect, because we know also when we create an avatar on someone else's system, that they also own some of that avatar, depending on the terms and conditions. I might not have rights to it, but I might. So you've just transitioned from privacy into property to some degree there, and welcome to our battle. Indeed. And, and um, so there's another interesting part of the definition that, um, that I think we should highlight, um, because uh, Walter and Brian Ulysses questions um, get to it. So we certainly did put weight, as you say, on of, by, and for, and that's supposed to suggest that this is an identity, you know, of you, by you, for you, maybe distinguishing it to some extent from identities assigned to you and that you, you, you know, you barely control. Um, we have Google identities, we have employee identities, we have driver's licenses, you know, these are all valid identities, yeah. but they're not of this type. They're not our personal digital identity. So there's this other word that has evolved, and I encourage you to go back to the, you know, there's not a lot of legislative history, but if you see the three hearings that we've had on it and the different drafts, you'll see the evolution of how do we capture and distinguish between, um, you know, on the one side, like a deep fake or something that isn't mine, and on the other side, something that's truly, some people actually have used the word self-sovereign, like that's really putting a sharp uh, point on it. Um, and so it's that word that we're in the current draft, uh, Senator Rothfuss uh, pointed out, dominion, over which the person has dominion. Um, and so what does dominion mean? Well, it's such an interesting word, partly because, you know, the definition includes um, words like control, uh, power, ownership. Um, each one of those words raises some, you know, wrinkles legally, uh, but a word that includes them and connotes all of that really does get at what we're saying. So just to apply that for a moment to this novel creative question from Brian Ulysses about my, my centaur avatar, I, um, to me, it, it, as Senator Rothfuss said, it very much seems like that. It certainly could be if it's up by and for you. 
But now we can ask some of the, as, as you were saying, the second level questions. I don't know this system, but was it set up in a way where every other Tuesday, the service has it announce, you know, advertising messages and promoting their affiliate <laughs> systems, or does it prevent you from saying certain things? Does it, are they reserving some dominion over the avatar that you also sometimes act through according to the terms and conditions? The more that's happening, the less dominion you have, and therefore it may not be this type that we're talking about. Um, so I encourage everybody to meditate upon these words. I seldom say this about a statute, um, but actually this is, not only is it going to be helpful, I believe, for the well-functioning economy and society of Wyoming, but I think that this might in fact be a good example of the kind of pillars we're going to need for a legal framework to successfully transition to the digital age with our values intact and, and that special place for human beings. Um, Absolutely. And I, Des, I see two other questions that I think are, are really good. And, and uh, one of them we haven't talked much about, actually. The please. first that I see is, is the interoperability question from Nadia uh, and how to recognize state to state, state to federal. And, and that is a challenge. First mover matters, obviously. Uh, a lot of what we're doing right now relates to companies that would be corporations and individuals that would be domiciled or residents of Wyoming. We can do a lot with regard to that. Uh, but one of our challenges is not to bias any of the digital identity products, not to be technology specific, but to be technology general and neutral and to be framework general and neutral. Uh, we're certainly going to try and comply and comport with California's the CCPA with a lot of what we do on privacy, but that interoperability is certainly going to be a challenge in the absence of any uh, direct federal guidance and, and they're reticent to do that. I don't expect that to happen soon. Uh, the other question that I, I wanted to address was, uh, looks like it's Ben uh, Bev Corwin's, excuse me, uh, with regard to legal guardianship, power of attorney, and, and particularly for children, wards of state, disabled persons, and other vulnerable persons. Great question. Uh, and my hope is that we can arrive at a point where it, it's seamless, transparent, and entirely uh, similar to what we currently have in statute, such that the digital identity as a representation of the personal identity uh, would, would follow precisely the same legal obligations as representations on behalf of that individual by guardians, attorneyship, wards, uh, and, and, and the state, et cetera. So you'd, you'd end up with the same rights and privileges transferring equivalently. So if we do it right, I think that's where we would get, but I, that might be easier said than done. So it, honestly, that's the first I've seen of that discussion. And so I appreciate that, uh, Bev, raising that so that we can contemplate it. May, may I pop up a, uh, I, I wish we had, oh, I don't know, an entire semester with you, but we, we only have a few more moments. So can I pop up the last question? Um, it comes from a person uh, that you know, uh, who's been very helpful to your committee and to, I think, Wyoming, and uh, who of course is an MIT alum and a valued member leader in the MIT computational law community, our own Brendan Marr. Um, and my friend. Uh, and so he asks, what is the, um, I'll paraphrase a little bit, like the, what is your vision of the highest best success in like say a five year horizon for your many efforts in, 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 in through your committee and, and for Wyoming? Excellent. And Br Brendan, thank you so much. Brendan has been uh, instrumental as well. He, he has participated in, in our uh, task force and select committee uh, over the last few years and has has contributed his his thoughts and work towards our product and solution as as has Daza. So thank you for that. And as far as the vision, there, there are a few things. I mean, underlying a lot of our vision is a, a simple desire really to, to have Wyoming have a, a relevant future. Uh, we are a coal, oil, and gas state. Um, those are largely going to be past tense uh, in the not so distant future as things that we do. 
Uh, we don't know what the timeline's going to be, but we rely on them now. And so those of us in the legislature that are forward looking are trying to think, all right, well, what can Wyoming contribute to the future in a way that will help Wyoming to continue to remain relevant and successful as a state, to help our economy, to produce good jobs and, and, and to be uh, leaders in the future instead of leaders in the present and past. Uh, so from one standpoint, success to me will be success from that standpoint, where, where Wyoming remains uh, relevant. We have industry surrounding this, and, and we've got a, a strong industrial presence because we've created this, this regulatory framework that brings the best visionaries in, in digital assets to want to be a part of Wyoming. Uh, as, as far as my, my broader putting on my hat of an advanced technology um, expert. The, the vision that I see is, and, and five years might not quite get there, but it, it's getting towards it. Uh, the idea where I, I do have knowledge and control of my identity in a way that I don't right now in, in a, a capacity where I can protect it, right? My, my wife's uh, identity was just stolen a couple of weeks ago. And so we're getting all sorts of great letters of we're sorry, but we are not willing to open this bank account for you in Guam or wherever else they're, they're using her identity, right? Trying to get past that point where we control our identity and manage it. Uh, get to the point where privacy rights are respected again. Uh, you know, I'm. Uh, th there's bipartisan desire to erode privacy right now at the national level and in most states, and and I, I'm one that's counter to that. I, I believe with digital identities we can get back to the point where we can uh, secure our privacy and have control over our individual privacy better than we do right now, uh, and manage it more appropriately. Uh, and then. Third, really, this when we get to the point where we have more seamless and transparent uh, contract and commerce capabilities that, that streamline some of the things that really shouldn't be challenging. Writing a will right now, we've been working on that. Writing a will is a pain. How is that still a pain? We've been doing this for thousands of years. Uh, and, and yet it's still awful. You know, there, there are a lot of things that we can enable through a digital identity that, that should become seamless that are not right now. So five years from now, I, I hope that, that we've led uh, the country in that direction and, and made a lot of this easier and, and made a lot of it more individually empowering uh, than, than what we've got right now, where we, we sort of just go and flow with the streams of information around us and lack control of that information about ourselves. Indeed. Um, thank you so much, uh, especially for those words uh, at the end that kind of, you know, signal, uh, you know, what the first principles and values are and the guiding lights for this. Uh, and, you know, let's all take that on board. Uh, we're all not legislators, but we all do have our influence from our own corners of the world. And, uh, the stitching together of these legal frameworks and and other fabrics. And so uh, I think and I appreciate that, what you said. We do need to move a, on to the next speaker yeah, soon. Can, uh, can, I, can I make one closing comment? It will be quick. Please do. Thank you. Uh, we've gotten where we've gotten because we've brought in the best minds and the experts. We are not those people in the Wyoming legislature. We've just been clever enough to recognize that if we listen to smart people will go in the right direction. So I invite all of you to please participate and bring your best ideas to us. Thank you, Daza. You're welcome. And uh, let me, I just wanna say, um, Senator Rothfuss means it. If again, look at the, click on the YouTubes of these hearings. This is um, when I was growing up and learning about civics and how government was supposed to work. I learned that it was a deliberate you know, fairly intelligent, um, uh, de well, deliberative, like open discussion, you know, finding out the, the best way to go, for, uh, letting a lot of voices be heard. When I worked in politics in various legislatures and other places, I discovered it what didn't seem that way at all and somewhat disillusioned. Well, I have hope again, um, having worked with this 
Select Committee, they are doing it the way I thought it was supposed to be done. They really do listen um, and they really do um, grapple with the ideas and they come up with terrific legislation as a result. So go ahead, test, test this challenge and take Senator Rothfuss up on his challenge of, or his invitation uh, to come and participate and contribute and see what happens next. I think you'll be as pleased as the rest of us. So thank you so much, Senator Rothfuss. I, I encourage you to, or I invite you to stay if you need to go to other matters, we completely understand. And, uh, and now we're going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to move forward now with our, oops, wait, who's screen sharing? So oh, I, I put it on screen share per the back channel chat that we had. Oh, I didn't see that. Okay, uh, why don't, uh, okay, go, great. So let me get back to, damn it, I've now lost you know how you can click a button and then lose the screen in <laughs> Zoom? Okay, well, so next we have, um, we're, we have, um, excuse me, uh, Yulila Panfil of New America, who's going to talk about how do we prove ownership of property um, in, in a post-disaster um, context in particular. And this very interesting project that uh, that I've linked to in our notes uh, called the um, basically digital footprints, um, and and so it's a I would say it's a very novel uh, it's a novel approach and it's one that's particularly needed and it and it really raises a combination of business and operational questions, le very much legal questions and absolutely technology questions. Uh, for the common good. So with, with that, Yulila, if, you, if you'd like to um, introduce yourself a little bit more and, uh, and, uh, and, and what you're working on, I'd be grateful. And everyone, please listen closely because we're going to offer an opportunity um, at the end of Yulila's remarks uh, where everyone enrolled in this class now can get involved in a, in a, um, in a workshop with Yulila and other stakeholders to tackle some of these questions. So um, with that in mind, um, thank you again for joining us, Yulila, and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks so much, Daza, and uh, thank you to Senator Rothfuss. That was fascinating, and I uh, wish that we could have listened uh, for another two hours uh, to that discussion. It was really remarkable. Um, so, uh, Daza, uh, for the presentation, would you like for me to share my screen to, take, to go through the PowerPoint, or do you prefer that it's done on your end? Um, oh, am I sharing the screen right now? Yeah, you yes. took over. Sorry, um, I thought you were, excuse me, Brian. Um, would you like to, actually, you know, it might be best if you did share, sure. um, so yeah. you can advance um, as you like. Yeah, Sorry. I'll drive. Um, I'll do a quick intro um, and I'll uh, run, I'll try to run quickly through this PowerPoint. Uh, so my name is Yulia Panfil. I'm uh, the director of the Future of Land and Housing Program at the Think Tank New America. Our program looks at land and housing rights challenges, both domestically and internationally. And actually this research that I'll share with you grew out of um, some work that we had been doing a couple of years ago at the intersection of self-sovereign identity and uh, property. And that um, research led us to this question of, um, you know, how can people use uh, some of the data that they're starting to generate through, particularly through their smartphone use to help prove where they live. Um, so with that, let me just share my screen. <clears throat> um, can you just give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? It looks yeah. good. All right, great. So let me just uh, slide into present mode. Um, okay. Is it big? You, you, like the screen is big. You can see all of it. All right. See it. Uh, it's not in presentation mode, but it is big. Oh, strange. Hold on. Let me do. Okay. Here we go. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, our program works on land, housing, and property rights globally. And what we know is that nearly half the world lacks any sort of formal documentation to their land and their homes. 
Um, and so titles and things like that. And because of that, they're often locked out of the rights that these documents confer. So most famously, for example, they can't go to a bank and get a loan because the bank needs a, a title for um, in order to you know, use your home as collateral. But there's a range of other benefits that you're just not going to qualify for if you don't have proof of uh, home occupancy. And the reason this disconnect exists is that the credentials, the forms of proof that the government requires to issue property documents are um, often unattainable. Uh, so a, an example we use famously is that in Uganda, there are uh, less than 100 surveyors for the entire country. Uh, and in order to get a title, you need to get your land surveyed, right? So it would take Uganda more than a thousand years at this rate to give a home title to everyone. And this has several different impacts. It, here in the US, in Puerto Rico, um, after Hurricane Maria, a quarter million Puerto, Rico, Puerto Ricans actually couldn't access FEMA disaster assistance because they couldn't prove to FEMA that they were the legal occupants of the homes that had been destroyed. In India, a quarter of um, all court cases are land disputes. And they often just languish in the courts because neither party has the documents necessary to prove that the property is theirs. In Colombia, and this isn't unique to Colombia, in post-conflict societies all over the world, um, you know, refugees and IDPs can't return home because they can't prove that the homes they had fled from were theirs. But what we know is that the um, administrative reality, uh, what we call administrative reality, so the accepted documentation, um, is not the same as natural reality. So what does that mean? Um, the pieces of paper that you use to prove uh, your home occupancy, for example, a title or an ID document or a survey or a will, um, aren't the only ways to prove where you live or that you you know, own or occupy your home, right? There are myriad different ways that you can prove that. Where your packages are delivered, where you sleep at night, um, proof that you paid uh, to, you know, put up a fence around your home, um, the attestations of your neighbors. But the problem is that until very recently, that natural reality, those facts on the ground occurred in the analog world, right? It was undetected and it was undocumented. But as we know, over the last decade, that's really begun to change. We're using smartphone penetration is exploding um, across the world. You know, globally, it's at 40%. In the US, it's at 85% uh, ride share, e commerce, uh, digital payments. We're starting to generate this tapestry of evidence of where we go, what we purchase, and who we interact with. So that leads us to a question these billions of people who have been locked out of getting. Um, property documentation, can they instead be empowered to harness their own trove of digital evidence to prove where they live? And how do you do that? So I wanted to kind of make this a little bit more concrete. Um, I decided to just test this very quickly on my very rudimentary point across, you know, your Google Maps location history, if you carry a smartphone, is a pretty predictable indicator of where you spend your time, right? So I decided to um, pull up and map my Google Maps location history between the years 2015 and 2016. I live in Washington, DC. And as you can see, you know, there are three red dots on the map. The one all the way South was my job at the time. I worked my home for most of that period. And then to the north was the new home that I had moved to towards the end of that time. Zooming in a little bit more, you can 
really see quite clearly a big red bullseye over the exact address of my home. So I lived at 1862 Wyoming Avenue. You can see 1864 to the left, 1868. Uh, um, and uh, you could see, right, the bullseye over my home. So that's interesting, but of course that can be faked. So what if you start to combine, combine that with other forms of digital proof? So using a website called LifeScope, I pulled up and mapped my um, social media use, my Facebook and Twitter posts. Um, and uh, you know, what this site does is it shows where things are being posted from. And indeed, this um, I pulled it up for the end of the time period. And this was my new address and this cluster of posts all being made from this new address. And perhaps the most interesting was a single post that I zeroed in on, uh, which was this post right here. It was a Facebook post that I had made from that time um, telling my friends that my husband and I had bought a house, right? So, and what's really interesting is that um, I, I've spent some time working in um, developing, uh, developing country settings helping people register their land. And what they do when they register their land is they put up the proposed registration on a basically a public bulletin board in the center of town for a number of weeks. And people have a few weeks to dispute it or confirm it. And what struck me was that the um, pieces of information that I had inadvertently put into my own post uh, very closely mirrored um, what was in these public posts that were being put up in Tanzania and elsewhere. So you can see that, uh, you know, I write a little patch of dirt to call our own. So I'm specifying the type of right, right? That it's an ownership right. You see that I've included not just myself, but my husband in the picture, right? So it's showing the occupants. You see the address of the home behind us. And perhaps most interestingly, you see the sort of likes and comments at the bottom uh, to the post. So that's a representation of my public square, my community affirming that they are on notice that I am claiming this property as my own. So the point here is that each piece of this digital evidence isn't itself dispositive, but combined, they start to form a relatively convincing picture. So this is just an example of you know, multiple different types of digital evidence that could be combined to uh, form a pretty convincing picture of where someone lives. Um, and you know, this is something that could be quite a bit more accessible than the traditional means of documenting property. I'm just gonna pause here for a second, um, you know, uh, to let you scan the various questions that of course come up immediately about this proposal, right? There are several technical issues, you know, what's the easiest way to collect, store and share this information, you know, particularly for people who aren't tech savvy, what are the privacy considerations? And then there are the legal questions. I think most importantly, under what conditions would an administrative agency or another end user actually trust and accept this data to prove as proof of address? And with that, and I'll end the presentation in a second, I'm gonna transition into quickly describing a specific case study for this idea that we're thinking about quite actively, and that is Puerto Rico. So as I mentioned, um, uh, at the beginning of the presentation, after Hurricane Maria, um, 75,000 um, applications for housing aid in Puerto Rico were denied because FEMA couldn't prove that the people who were applying for their homes um, were uh, the rightful occupants. So, FEMA's aid um, in, after a hurricane is governed by the Stafford Act, which, provide, which allows FEMA to provide money to repair what are called owner-occupied private residences. And this is really important 
Because an owner, you can prove that you are an owner occupant in a few different ways. You can be the legal owner, right? And you can present a title, but you can also be someone who doesn't hold a formal title, but also doesn't pay rent. So, you know, somebody who may have, for example, inherited the home from their parents doesn't have formal ownership, but is the rightful occupant, right? And that's the third um, uh, criteria here, somebody who has lifetime occupancy rights, but with a formal title vested in someone else. But the problem is it's really difficult to prove and in Puerto Rico in particular, because of the particularities of their legal system, which I won't get into, there is a huge number of people who kind of fall into this in-between category of rightful occupant, but not legal owner. And as a result, you had this you know, huge amount of applications um, who were, that were uh, denied. So multiple legal aid organizations have called on FEMA to expand what it accepts as proof of owner occupancy. And the question that I wanna leave you with and something that we're thinking really actively about right now is, you know, could tapestry credentials, could these digital trails be part of that expansion? And if so, what would be the technical and legal requirements for FEMA to um, take that on board? Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you so much um, for that. Uh, so let me, so if for those that have a question, uh, let's try to at least get to one. Um, and if you could pop them up and I'll ask um, Brian and, uh, and our TAs to help select one. And let me just say, for those of you that are, that are interested in this um, and think it's important as, as I do, um, let us know, um, and I'll send in the follow-up email, a simple link probably to our, um, our input form, uh, where you can let us know if you would like to join a uh, informal, basically like a workshop uh, session with you, Leela, that we'll set up um, in the, uh, it'll, it'll be after this class, uh, it'll be after January, uh, but we'll, we'll aim for, we'll find a time, but I'm kind of thinking maybe February-ish. Uh, and, uh, and, and we can really dig into this. And some of the things that one could do uh, might include, um, you know, um, taking a close, some of you that are legally inclined to take a closer look at the Stafford Act and take a closer look at the legal frameworks that apply here. Um, people could look at things like example affidavits uh, that um, partners of ULILA have put together uh, to fill some of the gap uh, as part of filings with FEMA. Um, so forth to prove occupancy and take a look some of you that are technically inclined could take a look at some of the data structures and how to collect and package and submit some of these digital footprints that we learned about. And we could maybe even think those of you that are government people, um, you know, what could a, you know, process look like for a FEMA or others of the future where they would, um, you know, adopt a rule or policies that would permit these types of filings. And, this is um, this is what I would consider a good legal hack session, uh, and uh, and we invite you all to join us. Um, and so, and also, if for the we don't have a lot of time, unfortunately, uh, to engage with you. So this will also be a great escape valve and opportunity for people that really want to take this up to go deeper um, with her on this topic. But for now, um, who uh, won't uh, the one of our um, class um, leaders um, share one of the questions for Yalila to address? So we have a question from Bruna. Um, what are the motivations for the POC being realized outside the US um, and specifically Uganda and not somewhere else? There's no specific motivation for Uganda. Uh, I just brought that up as an example of, uh, you know, as a really stark example of why the traditional methods aren't working. I think that generally outside of the US, the contexts in which this would be most applicable are post-conflict scenarios for, um, for a specific reason. In post-conflict scenarios, the typical rules for proving home ownership or property ownership or occupancy are relaxed. Um, because it's an emergency situation. Um, and so instead of being governed by a country's uh, domestic 
uh, legal framework, oftentimes a country will set up what's called a land restitution tribunal, and that restitution tribunal is um, guided by UN rules, which have much more relaxed evidentiary requirements. So this presents a little bit more flexibility to be able to petition those tribunals to um, look at a broader range of evidence. Okay, very cool. Uh, and, and if we've got time for one more, Walter has a question that's kind of a follow-up, which is um, about the potential benefits uh, to the government, um, as well as for having this system in place. So. Um, for instance, after a disaster, governance can more accurately and quickly identify neighborhood occupancy and residential needs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that uh, from a humanitarian standpoint, of course, a government doesn't want to have a quarter million of its people uh, which is what happened in Puerto Rico, right? It was a humanitarian disaster because people for years couldn't get back into their homes, but also kind of zooming one level up um, after the earthquakes in Haiti about a decade ago, um, the government actually couldn't uh, rebuild the roads because they didn't know whether people's where people's destroyed homes had been and whether the roads that they were proposing to build were gonna go right through where somebody's home had once stood. So from an infrastructure and rebuilding standpoint, it's really important to identify you know, who occupies what and get people back in their homes. From kind of stepping back and trying to get more people um, getting property documents to more people. Uh, for you know, many developing country governments, it's a tax motivation, right? It's a way to get people to, to increase the property tax base. So there's definitely a motivation for governments to increase the number of people who uh, have some sort of property documentation. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, Yulia, um, for, for going over that. And honestly, we did just open the book on this. Uh, and we barely got to into the dialogue. Um, so, um, so two things. Number one, uh, we have another topic. Many of you have, have signed up for projects. We've run out of time. And so what I'd like to do, if Brian, can you stay with us another five minutes? I'll be late for another thing, but I can try and pull five minutes. Okay, so we're going to keep the recording going for five more minutes. Anyone that can stay with us, stay on the line, or you can check the recording later. And Brian will go over um, some of the depth of projects, um, you know, the, the, the what, the how, the why. Um, and, and again, uh, uh, for you, Leela, excuse me, Leah, forgive me. Uh, we, we, we did talk about something like what, mid or late February uh, for the workshop. Is that still good for you? That's perfect. Perfect. Okay. So let this be a good beginning and, and let, let, let's come together and, um, and, and see if we can apply some of the skills we're learning in collaboration uh, with, with you, Leah, to, to make this much easier. This is a solvable problem. We can make progress on this. Um, and we can also learn a great deal by, by, by helping to push the ball forward. So let us do that. So with that, I want to just thank you very much for your presentation and the diligence of, of putting it all together and, and making yourself available now to the class. Um, let's all thank you, Leah. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And yes, please reach out if you're interested in helping. We need your brains. So <laughs> thanks, Daza. You're welcome. You're here. Great, and so with that, uh, Brian, if you would like to, oh, so anyone that has to go, you are excused. Um, for anybody that would like to stay and hear about projects, we have um, a special session now that'll go about five minutes. Um, and Brian, uh, take it away, please. Hey, everybody. So a lot of you have all submitted some projects. Uh, I think we have 22 or 23 so far, which is very exciting. Um, and the way that we're going to do the submissions is uh, the way that we've done a lot of stuff for this computational law course, which is we're going to have you fill out a Google form. And in this Google form, there are going to be two places for you to submit something. Um, we're requesting that each student who wants to do a final submission submits a quad chart. And I'll get into what exactly is in a quad chart here in a moment. And then um, we'll also have space for students to submit 
um, one of either a prototype, a paper, or a pitch deck, as we've been kind of talking about earlier on. Um, the reason that we're asking everyone to submit a quad chart is because this is one for one something that is used in um, numerous classes that are run at the media lab. And with the, the quad chart, the, the benefit is to making you concisely and clearly know exactly what the innovation is that you're interested in um, kind of exploring and how you can take it from an idea to something that can be implemented. And so an example that uh, is used quite frequently um, is this kind of DARPA, you know, single chip teraflop computing slide. You know, you can clearly see the what the kind of basic diagram of how it looks, how it works. You can see that here. You have a quick understanding of what the transformative aspects of this technology are. They're condensed into these kind of bullet point style um, descriptions. Same thing with the impact. You know, how is it actually going to change the, the space? And so for you, this would be, how is this going to change the computational law space? What innovations are going to take place? And then the final slide is the, the rollout. So if you're writing a paper, this will look different than if you're doing a pitch deck. And that will look different if you're doing a prototype. But all of these things are really interconnected. And the reason that we wanted to offer each of these three kind of uh, options for you all is because these options are all interconnected in the same way that you take an idea from the idea phase to the phase where it's actually realized as kind of a final object. And we will be sending out, in addition to the Google form with the information about how to submit, a, a templatized version of this uh, slide that you can just go in and edit as you would like and based on the, the work that you are exploring. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, I know later tonight, I'm going to try and get to everybody's responses uh, for a second round of feedback. And so with that, uh, I'll hand it back to um, Daza to wrap us up. You bet. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Brian. I know I know that you had to be a little late, but I think so. You know, if you've signed up for a project, um, keep the momentum going. This is the important part now, and it really I've done this as uh, as a participant in classes. I've helped to teach this method. Brian has been on both uh, on um, involved in it as well. It works, um, and it's and it's it's not a big deal to do each step. So just to fill up the quad chart initially doesn't take that much time. It's never perfect. Just give it a try, send it, and it can be iterated, and then that brings you to the next step of, of um, you know, answering the right questions for the project. Uh, so, so here we go uh, on projects. Now, with that, um, everybody start thinking about space, the 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 next frontier. Um, we're going to go to space next Friday, and it's going to be marvelous. Um, so. Uh, we're definitely creating new legal frame new legal frameworks are emerging right now it's the perfect use case for computational law um and we're, we've got some amazing speakers at the forefront of the field so so i encourage you i'll send out some readings in advance but i just say make sure you're in a quiet place have your lunch and coffee in advance and you know come to play um and so with that um thank you very much and I, i'd like to hand it uh back to uh tma if, if you'd be so kind to bring us out you got it, Daza. Okay, thank you so much, Brian. And thank you for everyone who participated today and to our speakers, Yulia and Senator for your office. Um, I know that we have a lot of questions um, that we weren't able to get to. So please feel free to use our form or to reach out via Telegram um, or to office hours actually this week as well. So thanks everyone. And we'll see you back here next week for our final class. Bye. Bye.